So the first thing about the structures associated with Buddhism is that Buddhism did not exist in isolation. We have done the basic Buddhist ideas and practices. Buddhism and other religious sects that were emerging at that time were in constant dialogue with the other traditions of the time. And the Buddhist ideas and practices, they emerged out of this dialogue, which was taking place all the time. And this is what we see in the sacred places that emerged as the Buddhist places. So it is very important for us to understand the word sacred. People tended to regard certain places in as sacred. primitive, animist way of worshipping. Trees, rocks, mountains, rivers, and anything which is that they were in awe of, people worshipped it. That's why you have nature worship. Can you give me examples of uh, the trees, the rocks, the mountains, which were worshipped? Are you able to hear me? Are you aware? Yes. The Bodhi tree? Yes. Any other tree which is considered to be sacred, even as a part of mm -hmm. other trees? Traditions, yes. Arna, mm. Tulsi, yes. Ma'am, the people trees associated with Yes, mm. people tree, yes, banyan tree. Mm. People tree, definitely. The name is considered the to Buddhist. be sacred. Started considering this building as the place of prayer, the place of congregation, a place which was attached to the Buddhist Sangha or the congregation hall. So these things happened over a period of time. But there, were, there are a number of chetyas which came into existence later on, which don't have anything to do with it being a funerary mound at all. So let's see some of these chetyas. Can you give me examples of the chetyas? Let's see. Go back. Let them see the chetyas. The first one is uh, the Lomas Rishi chetya, which is one of the oldest ones. Then the other ones that you are, you'll be generally familiar with is the Karle one and the Ajanta one, which is world famous. And that and the next ones are the ones found near Bhuvaneshwar. There are a whole series of them near Bhuvaneshwar. And um, so those are the ones associated with Ashoka and uh, the various inscriptions associated with Ashoka. And there are Jain monk caves over there and there are Buddhist caves over there. Okay, so um, can somebody, does anybody know anything about the Lomas Rishi cave? It's in Bihar. Do you know anything about the Lomas Rishi cave? Ma? Yes? Ma, it's called the Grotto Lomas of Rishi. Yes, so there was one more name for it, and it's a, a rock that cave that still comes out of a sanctuary. It's one of the oldest caves shelters which has been found in India. You know, in the initial days, in the days when the monks uh, could not move around too much, in times uh, in, on rainy days and in rainy months, they needed a shelter. And they constructed these rock shelters. They found these rock shelters and made it comfortable for themselves. And they started living over here. And because they did not generally like to live in a constructed structure. So they found these naturally found caves. And they lived over there. This is true for monks. This is true for the Buddhist nuns. This is true for the Jaina monks as well. And it is also true for the sannyasis. They love to live in caves, naturally formed structures. So you find a whole range of them in the ancient times because these were the shelters which were used by the monks and they were embellished by the monks by their craft work and by their artwork. That's how the Ajanta caves were created. 
beautiful paintings inside the Ajanta caves were made by Buddhist monks themselves. And all the various sculptures and so on, and so on they were all works of art done by the Buddhist monks. And so these are all structures starting from the gateway to various things made inside the cave structures were all creations of these monks who lived there for a long period of time to meditate and to recoup and because they were not allowed to walk around because they can kill little animals in the rainy times and hence they did not walk around at all and they rested in this period. This resting time was used to write scriptures, to have dialogues with people and also to make these kinds of craft work. That's why you find such beautiful caves, embellished ones and that. Any questions? Any comments? Any additions that you want to make? None at all? Okay, let's move on to the next. Let's see where these caves are. Let's see if you can see them. This is a very beautiful, um, you know, inner structure of the Karli caves. And you do find, you, you realize that this is actually made by Ashok over here. And because you have the Ashokan's thumb over there. And then you do find a stupa inside over there. And, and it's, a, it's a prayer hall. Let's move on to the next. This is the actual one. That was the design. And this is the actual one which you find over here. It's difficult to believe that it is a rock shelter. In the initial days, the Buddhists did not have the practice of worshipping Buddha as an icon. They generally worship the, the sculpture of a stupa. A stupa that was built on the relic of Buddha. So you find a stupa inside this particular rock shelter being recreated. And uh, is a very beautiful structure, as you can see. The Buddhist monks and nuns would sit over here, meditate, and read scriptures. That's what it is a congregational hall, as you can see it. The beautiful carved pillars. Yes. Difficult to believe that this is actually a rock shelter. Yes, next. Uh, Ma'am. Yes, Anna. Uh, what is the significance of the design of a particular stupa? Would they make uh, some? Would they make the stupa with, with some special thought in their mind? Yes, the stupa. We will come to it a little later. You can ask me this question when we come to describing a stupa. We have just done the check here at the moment okay so we will talk about the stupa a little later it is probably there in the next few slides we will talk about it you can ask this question and keep this question reserved okay so major buddhist uh, sites as we can see the ones that you should know about is sarna barhut which is uh, right uh, outside madhya pradesh which is in up it's a corner of madhya pradesh it's right there the Bodh Gaya, where you have, uh, uh, you know, the other one. And then you have Sanchi, Ajanta, Karli, Nagarjuna Kunda, and Amaravati. These are the most annasic. You have several. So these are the main that you're supposed to know about. You should be able to mark it on a map as well. So let's see where these are. Let's do the Ajanta Caves. It's one of the most beautiful structures. How many have been? How many of you have been to Ajanta? It's in a horseshoe uh, shape. When you come from Aurangabad and you're moving towards Ajanta, you know there is this mountain top over there. From there you can see the entire view, the semicircular view, the horseshoe shape in which the entire Ajanta is placed. 
you know and uh, you can see that from the top and it's one of the most beautiful panoramic views um which, uh, which you can get of ajanta So this is your Ajanta Caves. It's a place near the Ajanta Caves. Let's move on. This is Karle. We want uh, uh, this one, Ajanta only. This is Elora. Elora is also very close to Ajanta. Uh, not very far from Ajanta. Elora is very well known for um, Hindu cave architecture, Jain cave architecture, and some Buddhist as well. So this is the Karle Caves. Each one of the entrance gates was unique. The next one is Barhot. Which is in the corner of Madhya Pradesh. One corner, one step from it is UP. Okay, the most beautiful, of course, is Sanchi. If you can zoom in on Sanchi, it will be good. It's one of the most beautiful structures. It's in the middle of a forest, and it was left undiscovered for a very long period of time. It was a set of um, railway contractors who saw this stupa when they were constructing the railway tracks in Vidisa, and that's when the Sanchi stupa was discovered for the first time. They, wa they wanted to pilfer all the stones found over here and take it away for building their railway track because they had no um, idea about what this was all about. And uh, later on, the British officials wanted to take away all the sculptures from here and put it in their backyard gardens um, or in the gardens of the various British buildings and so on. But this was not allowed at all by the rulers of Bhopal at that time. They played a very significant role in keeping Sanchi Stupa intact. Sultan Jahan Begum played a very important role in keeping the Sanchi Stupa preserved. So we will be talking about the role played by these rulers of uh, Bhopal, who had control over these monuments and played a significant role in keeping it mm -hmm. intact. The Amaravati Stupa, yet another beautiful stupa made uh, by the Buddhists. Entire thing is lost. You don't have any remnants of the Amaravati Stupa at all. Whatever that was left was also completely ruined because of a flood and later on, they wanted to construct a dam near it. And hence, the Amaravati and the Nagarjuna Konda structures were affected by it. And hence, hardly anything is left of the Amaravati Stupa particularly. And very, very interestingly, on the 50th year of freedom, when the British brought in all their artifacts that they had collected from all over the world, to the various museums in the various countries, they came to India as well and put up a show in um, the National Museum. And I had the privilege of going for it along with the students. There, we found an entire wall of Amaravati Stupa was brought back for display. An entire wall, beautifully embellished wall, beautifully carved. They had taken an entire wall of Amaravati Stupa to their British Museum. And currently, it is in the British Museum. They brought it back to show it to us 
on the 50th year of freedom you actually pay to see your own artifacts in the british museum including the kohinoor for which you have to pay an extra cost to enter the place and see it that's what the british did to india so if they had their way they would have taken the taj mahal and could have recreated it in london for you to go and see it in london so they did not have it the opportunity to do it so they did not do it so this is the level to which the british went and they wanted to take the gateways of sanchi one of the most beautiful structures remaining of sanchi they wanted to take the gateways of sanchi and put it in their own country the french were very interested it was these two begums of the bhopal who ensured that this never really happened they were so interested in preserving these structures okay so about and also has anyone been to sanchi has had the opportunity of visiting sanchi madhya pradesh is a must visit place for anybody who is a history buff right next to sanchi you have right within the sanchi complex you have one of the first vishnu temples built in india ever you have that building right there and then now uh, the second one uh, which is very important for you is the bhim bhetka which is some kilometers away from sanchi where you find the artifacts left behind by the early man so bhim bhetka caves is a must for everybody it's spread over such a large area it is difficult for you to walk around and see it in even in one way you know they take you to a specific spot to show it to you but otherwise if you're going to walk around it's a place which is really huge and will take months for you to actually go and see so to feel that the early man actually walked out walked around over there is something which is a mind boggling experience you know to feel that over there and you'd realize there are so many huge stones lying over there and the kind of stones you find over there you would realize that yeah this could be a period of old stone age this could be a period of new stone age and so on so it's very very interesting it's a very different kind of an experience to go to a place which is a place of prehistoric dwelling yes any comments anything that you want to say once again ajanta is the most beautiful this is a unesco made movie because um, ordinarily people are not allowed to photograph inside the ajanta caves the uh, the uh, one sir come this is the as the so this is the place where uh, the monks lived this was a vihara in which the monks lived this is a place of monk dwelling within the the number of structures which are built by uh, the monks these are the dwelling places of the monks you can see the hard floor bedding the bed which is there this is a stupa definitely less embellished in comparison to the karle stupa karle vihara this is also a vihara 
wherein there is a stupa within the vihara for the monks to assemble over there and meditate this is the outside of uh, outside area once again this is the next vihara which is there in the next cave and you have this buddha statue overlooking the entire place possibly because by the time this cave was made buddha came to be worshiped in the form of an icon so you have several caves showing several different sculptures of buddha the angels are overlooking on the walls you find a number of paintings of different kinds belonging to different time periods made by the buddha monks again but the most important one which you will see now is that of our our lokiteshwara this is one of the most beautiful and uh, this is what you find in uh, when ajanta is talked about it is this buddha avalokiteshwara with a little lotus in his hand that is the most important painting of ajanta there are many many caves as many as 55 caves here on this part of ajanta okay so a lot of different structures different kinds of structures almost all of them are cave dwellings this is the horseshoe shaped which i told you about you can see it from the top okay now let's come back to our uh, what we were doing in the class any comments anyone who has been to ajanta adnav any comments ma'am were these uh, like does this idol worship give the first evidence of mahayana buddhism occurring or this is like generally there definitely it is mahayana buddhism which has started emerging by this time and that's the reason why you find in the earlier caves there is no buddha statue and the later ones you do find the statue of buddha coming up because as i told you these caves are made over a period of time the earliest ones in the satavahana period and then moving on right up to the rashtrakuta times you will find the cave structures in um, ajanta so you will find a whole lot of them the rashtra the elora is primarily considered to be the rashtrakutas but here you find a range from one period to another and it's very very interesting to see that it remained sheltered for such a long period of time otherwise they would have been destroyed by the invaders you find such signs of this uh, destruction all around aurangabad if you remember i i don't know whether i talked to you about it or not aurangabad was the center from where aurangzeb ruled india for nearly 25 years of his lifetime he was chasing shivaji from pillar to post in maharashtra so aurangabad is barely 25 to 30 kilometers from ajanta so it is really a stroke of luck that ajanta caves remained untouched you do find destruction in elora caves you find destruction in many structures found in and around uh you know aurangabad but this one remained sheltered it was found by a british official that's when it came to light so it was a very very quiet place so people did not really see it at all yes anything that you want to say about this so let, let's move on to this next structure which is the stupa so the stupas were mounds where relics of buddha such as body remains or objects used by him were buried then after a certain period of time even the written scriptures of buddhism were placed underneath and the super stupa structure could be constructed 
Okay. So it, Ashoka distributed, in order to propagate Buddhism, he distributed Buddha's relics to every important town and ordered the construction of stupa. That might be one of the reasons why the stupas were built. Now, the question is, why were the stupas built at all? Because of the bodily remains of Buddha on which these structures were constructed. That's one of the most important. And then a number of stupas were built, the most important ones being the Barhut, Sanchi, and Sarnath. Okay. The first one is the entrance of Barhut. The second one is Sanchi. And the third one is the cylindrical one, which is Sarnath. Next. Yes, any questions now? Adnav, your question about stupa? But my question was that uh, how did they decide the design of the stupa? The, uh, you know, uh, the circular design or the cylindrical design, the bottom was always a circular one. Yes, the circumvallation is an idea which exists right in the beginning. The clockwise, the way that the sun is the center of the universe and the earth goes around it. The same way, you know, uh, I think uh, the explanation that was given earlier by uh, in one of the discussions that we had by Ujwal, that we are like particles of electron which have a pathway and we move along that particular path. So possibly in that same way, the circumambulation is a very important aspect of rituals for everything, be it a sacrifice or be it even going around the temple, you take circles of a temple. Similarly, circles of the stupa was also an important practice which was followed, an important tradition. There are circumambulation paths over there around every stupa. So he is saying that, yes, do this. That's coming from Sutta Pitaka. Sutta Pitaka is a text which is said to be compiled from the various sayings and the teachings of Buddha. Initially, the uh, Hinayanas, even till date, the Hinayanas do not really subscribe to Sutta Pitaka so much. They have now started accepting it, but the initial days they were completely averse to accepting Sutta Pitaka, which is entirely accepted by the Mayanas. They accept it as their text and they use it. But the Hinayanas believe that the path of Buddha should be followed. The way that he lived is more important for us to understand. But isn't that promising ritualism? Yes, can I read what you have written now? Uh, yes, Ma'am. Stupa evolved over time. Yes, Lavanya, yes. And Ashita, okay. Now, Upasana is saying, what are you saying, Upasana? Yes, ma'am, this practice of placing garlands or perfumes and erecting a structure, isn't that promoting some form of ritualistic practice, which Buddha is supposed to be against? So is there exactly. a chance that this text isn't accurate and has been doctored or framed on later? Well, let's not talk, to, talk about doctoring. There are different kinds of followers you have. You know, some followers find it very easier to worship, a, a, you know, a guru as some kind of an icon and worship uh, him or her in the form of an idol. It's a very easy method of worship. But for the others, they are because they don't want to follow the tougher method, that is following uh, the path of Buddha, the way he actually lived. That's not easy for everybody to follow. That's the reason why two groups emerged within Buddhism. One who call themselves as Hinayanas or the lesser vehicle, and the others who call themselves as Mahayanas or the greater vehicle. Yana means a vehicle. So Mahayana means the greater vehicle, and Hinayana means the lesser vehicle. So the lesser uh, uh, vehicle lot, that is the Hinayanas, did not take to the Sutta Pitaka so easily. They said that we will chart out a path based on the way that Buddha actually lived. 